And uh, with that, Commissioner. Well, thank you uh, all for for joining us uh, uh, again on water uh, related issues. Uh, as Larry uh, mentioned, our administration is deeply focused on modernizing our water infrastructure and eliminating risks to public health where, where, wherever we find them or anticipate they will be. And part of what uh, we want to share with you today is how we're uh, working to do that and to further that principle in the implementation of the lead service line replacement law that was enacted in July of last year and what we into what the next steps uh, will be what we've done since then and how uh, that may affect some of, of your reporting and what you may hear from uh, from your sources particularly in the coming weeks as residents throughout the state of New Jersey begin to get notice uh, that their home is served by a lead service line. So I'll start just with uh, some background. I have a, a short presentation I can pop up here uh, just to give you some some basics and then uh, we can we can take questions and, and chat uh, about uh, the issue uh, of the day. And so as I mentioned, the the lead service line replacement law saw, uh, enacted last July. Uh, governor signed on July 21st, if I, I have that date right. Um, oh, excuse me, I should I should have noted that I am I am joined here today uh, by the director of our water supply and geoscience program, uh, Trish Angelito. Um, and Trish's team has has done just an incredible amount of work to bring us to where we are, and there's so much more, uh, so much more to do. Uh, so you'll hear from her as well uh, in uh, after I close this up. So our state, as you probably heard me say before, has a tremendous amount of drinking water systems. Our tiny little state has over 3,500 drinking water systems. It's almost unbelievable when you think about it. Uh, what we're going to focus on today is the community water systems, the 570 community water systems that are subject to the lead service line replacement law. There are also non-transient, non-community uh, water systems that serve schools and hospitals, other types of facilities, uh, and then a number of uh, the transient systems uh, that service uh, other places throughout the state. And so uh, that's how we get to this rather large number. Um, the 570 number is large in and of itself. And so many of those systems are owned by local governments. Uh, some of them are owned by our, our investor owned utilities. Some of them are owned by municipalities, but operated by investor owned utilities. And so the lead service line replacement law uh, is a recognition of what we all here know. There is no safe level of lead uh, in drinking water uh, or elsewhere. It, present, it poses a significant threat, particularly to our children, uh, and we have to eliminate it where we find it, period. Now, lead, lead, of course, in drinking water is not the greatest lead risk to public health. That risk comes from lead paint. And nonetheless, we have to remove exposure where we find it. And there is a risk of exposure from drinking water. And what we have experienced in the last several decades uh, with respect to uh, systems ar around the country who have found that they have un unreasonably high levels of lead uh, being uh, service uh, in water being serviced to to our neighbors uh, it is a function of a very reactive system established by the federal government at the time the safe drinking water act was passed and we've got to change that system in new jersey we are the lead service line replacement law is one 
way that we're doing that, but it's not the only way. So we'll hit on a couple of other things. What the lead service line replacement law did uh, was to require community water systems to inventory their lead service lines to provide to to present public notification and to replace those lead lines. The law establishes a 10 year period. To replace those lines, although the law has uh, some uh, opportunities for extension in certain circumstances, the average replacement rate is supposed to be 10% uh, per year and. Inventory reports have to be continually updated and notice provide to consumers. And the reason that we wanted to ensure that we were talking to you today is uh, we'll show you a timeline in a moment is because. Many of these notices are being generated now, some of the and certainly by next week. By February 22nd, systems that are compliant. Are to have provided notice where lead service lines are found by certified mail to the residents. Now, that's a significant difference. That's a function of the law. Uh, so as to present this information to our neighbors in a way in a way that cannot be ignored, right? Cannot be confused with junk mail. And I imagine our team here imagines that folks may uh, be concerned by that notice, that folks may uh, be afraid even. And so we wanted to make sure that this was on your radar uh, and that you understood what uh, work we we're doing. Now, the law requires all, all lead service lines to be replaced by the water uh, system owner, right? So whether that's a municipality or whether that's an investor owned utility. And in the case of those government owned systems, the the cost of replacement can be assessed to the homeowner or it can be spread throughout the rate base. In an investor owned community water system, it can only be set, spread throughout the rate base. And as we've discussed uh, in, in briefings past, uh, this, uh, the state as a function of our routine work uh, and appropriations, as well as a new influx of funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law, we are poised to help water systems face this burden. And, by, and in doing that, reduce the cost of this transformation to homeowners to ensure that we're providing affordable clean drinking water. Now, lead service lines are not the only risk of lead in drinking water, right? And what we have to all be careful about is that we don't somehow send the message that in replacing your lead service line, you are risk free. That that lead in drinking water has been eliminated. That is not so. Regardless of replacement of all lead service lines, take Newark, for example, where we were just last Friday celebrating the replacement of 23,000 lead lines in two and a half years. Remarkable progress. We need to make their story every community's story. But that doesn't remove all risk because internal home plumbing, lead laden solder still presents a risk. And that risk still needs to be assessed under the Safe Drinking Water Act, and it still needs to be controlled for. Presently, and as many of you probably heard me say over the years in, in response to issues in Newark, the, the state is guided by right now the federal lead and copper rule, an inherently reactive regulatory scheme, an inherently cost-driven regulatory scheme, and as a function of that, we don't replace lead lines presently before this law or even apply corrosion control absent uh, a, a violation of a standard that we know is not fully protective of human health, right? Because that's the way the federal law was built. We do not think that is acceptable. And the Murphy administration has been endeavoring uh, to develop a New Jersey specific lead and copper rule that flips that paradigm that puts protection First, that assesses and protects. That's our paradigm. And we'll be proposing the New Jersey specific lead in copper rule in the coming months. 
because even during the period of this lead line replacement and after, there will be risk. That risk has to be understood on the front end, not wait for the problem, not react after we know folks have been exposed on the front end. And so that's what the New Jersey lead and copper rule will do. And there'll be more information to share about that in the weeks and months ahead. But just to put this in context of the overall timeline of, of uh, what I'm sure, what I know many of you have been attentive to uh, since, at least since I've been here the last three and a half years. The, the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, in, in establishing the federal lead and copper rule, this is the, the federal uh, Safe Drinking Water Act of the state, uh, established this very reactive system where we uh, sample and we don't require inventories of lead service lines. We don't require uh, corrosion control treatment unless there is exceedance above uh, a, a level. And since 2016, the DEP began adopting a more strict standard. Now, this is extra regulatory. The water systems don't have to listen to us if they don't have a lead, uh, uh, a lead action level exceedance. But we told them in 2018 that we are taking a really hard look at these issues and we were going to call in their plans, right? We're going to call in their inventories, so get ready. In 2019, we made the official call. We followed that up in 2020. Not every water system has responded. And now uh, there is a requirement that all water systems submit their inventories to the, to, to the DEP. Their initial inventory was required by law in September. Not all of them responded. And their updated inventory was due last month. Not all of them responded. And we'll pursue those who have not responded. And I'm sure you want to know who those are who haven't responded. We'll make that information available as, as, as soon as we can. We are in the process of digesting the inventories, uh, the updated inventories that came in at the end of January. But that end of January submission triggers the public notification. As a function of those January inventories, we know that over 180,000 lead service lines have been identified. And what I mean by that is where the material of the service line is known. That means 180,000 New Jerseyans are to get a certified notice of their lead line by next week. There, from the initial inventories that, that, again, we're in the process of digesting, we know that there are over a million lines on those inventories of unknown material. The point of the lead service line replacement law is for the community water systems to continually update their, their inventories. For those lines that are of unknown material, to investigate and know their material and to provide those updates to the DEP routinely as lead service lines are being placed. And so every year in July, an updated inventory is required. And so that is the, the, the overall picture that we wanted to make sure uh, that, that all were aware of here. We spoke earlier uh, to uh, a consortium of, of municipal officials and, and other elected leadership uh, to, to water, to, to uh, local governments that run water systems and those that do not, to put uh, this same, this very, this, this very thing on their radar as well. Um, it can, it can uh, be easy because we live in this work to, to, to assume others are, are so well aware uh, of what the requirements are and not everyone is. Um, and so we've also put together uh, a website, uh, offshoot of DEP's website, specific to lead exposure reduction. Thank you, Chelsea Brook, uh, for putting that in the chat. And so that website provides a number of points of information uh, relative to uh, this, this initiative 
and uh, an uh, puts forward frequently asked questions uh, and includes a number of, of resources for, for folks to consult uh, that uh, so as to be uh, more aware of, of what is afoot uh, and we'll update this uh, as we move forward. Uh, our hope is to arrive at a, a consolidated uh, point of information as to uh, the location of all of all lead lines in the state that doesn't exist today. Right, all of these water systems are required as they provide us their inventories to put those inventories on their own system websites. Some have done that, some have not. Uh, some have done that in map form. Some have done that in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and so we need to, uh, on our end, uh, seek the creation of a of a unified uh, database that will hold this locational information. Uh, and that's not built uh, as yet. Uh, we do have a tool. Uh, that is, that identifies homes suspected of having lead paint. So we have uh, uh, this mapping tool. The uh, our desire is to uh, as as we move further down the road here, have that tool uh, contain both lead service line information and lead paint information, so that you could just uh, very easily pop in an address and and see what the the suspected uh, or known risk is. But we're not yet there today. Um, but I'll leave it there. Uh, Pat and 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 Chelsea, uh, who is in the senior leadership of our water resource management program, uh, both here to to take questions. And so uh, I'll uh, I'll be quiet now. And uh, let's let's hear what you have. Oh, and Pat Gardner, did I see Pat Gardner, assistant commissioner, joined us? Thank you, Pat. Thank you, commissioner. Uh, we'll take questions now. Just remember to leave your uh, mics muted. Um, and raise your hand and we'll take the questions in the order in which they're received. Uh, Michael. Thanks, Larry. I just wanted to make sure I was clear. We were clear on the numbers. Um, what is the the current total of known um, lead service lines? Um, I think he said 180,000. Um, just making sure I got that number correct. It's over 180. Uh, Chelsea, do you have that uh, that number handy? Yes, we have um, the and just to as the commissioner was stating with the the issues with the lead service line, the numbers and and Trish can go into um, a very nice detailed description of why these numbers go up and down and change. But our September 2021 numbers are 186,830 known lead service lines and 1,084,258 of unknown material. Um, those are on the website and you can take a look at those. And just to follow up there, but those are, uh, that number's as of September. Um, so we're still working through what was turned in at the end of January. Okay. That's correct. And, and just one other point about the number um, under this new law, the definition of a lead service line includes galvanized materials as well. So that number includes both lead service line and galvanized materials. Trish, can you explain why it includes galvanized material? Yeah, so um, galvanized material also have a risk for lead release um, because the way the material is, um, lead can accumulate within that material. Um, and and so they also themselves are at risk um, to reduce to to be a lead exposure risk. Okay, Frank. Yeah, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can Can you give us an idea where these uh, hundred eighty thousand or hundred eighty six thousand service lines are cl are they clustered mostly in cities, urban areas, or are they are they pretty well dispersed? They're everywhere. Urban? everywhere. So the website has a map of, of projected locations. It's not to scale. Um, it is uh, it is rough cut at this point, but you'll see that uh, map on the website as well, Frank. But this is not exclusively an urban problem. Do we see more in older places? Sure, but it is not exclusive. Okay. Any other questions? Michael, Catalini? 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, Commissioner. I was wondering, so did you say that that the notifications to residents are just beginning to go out now? I, I missed part of that. Is that what's new today? Because the, 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 the inventory, we, we've kind of had a bit of a handle on for a little while, but it sounds like maybe the notifications are, are a new development. Yes, the notifications are the are the new development. Um, and what what we think is especially um, important about this is that they're they're going to be impossible to ignore. The law was set up that way. So folks who have not been attentive to these issues, who may have never even thought about it at all because our lives are busy. They may there are going to be people throughout the state who are learning about this for the first time and they may be scared. They may have a lot of questions and that will that 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 will pro provoke some some reactivity, I imagine. Okay. Larry, can you hear me? Larry? Yeah. Who Larry, this is Brian, Brian Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, if this I'm sorry, Brian. Yeah, if this is supposed to be a visual thing, when I called in, all it did was, or reacted to the invite or whatever, all it did was just set up the phone. So I uh, I don't know what happened, but I do have a couple of questions. One along the lines that the commissioner just talked about. Um, doesn't this suggest that uh, there will be a rush on, quite frankly, uh, bottled water? As you said, I think the uh, certified letters should be delivered starting, what, next week? or by the end of, uh, will be finished by the end of next week? Sorry, Mike, uh, or th I think that uh, that uh, your your phone was a little low there. I think what I heard um, was that uh, a question about whether there would be a run on bottled water. Uh, yes, I mean, you talked about people being uh, fearful. Uh, I remember covering the uh, the situation in Newark a few years ago when the city bought uh, bottled water for its residents and gave it out at street corners and schools and whatever. And that image still stays in my head. And I think uh, the, the uh, letters you said, certified letters will be received next week to 186,000 customers. Is that correct? That's correct. Sorry, so, uh, so I thought this was Mike. Brian, hello. And um, okay. so that's why we're talking to you. Because we do, we, we hope to not see that kind of panic. And, but, but I think it's a possibility that folks could panic, could be worried. And part of what we want to, to do is ensure the public, to assure the public that we are on the job, that this isn't new, that we have been working with community water systems over the last several years in order to ensure that to ensure their compliance and that we are taking very proactive steps, among the most proactive in the country, to ensure that folks are protected, that their health is protected, that their families are protected. But you receive a certified letter that you have a lead line connecting your house, and you could, you could be, you could be worried. That's why we put together uh, this this website as a point of public information and education, and we'll be pushing out messaging because I think this will awaken folks not uh, that have not been part of this conversation in in recent years, and we want to make sure we bring folks along. But there That's shouldn't funny. there should not be a run on bottled water. There should not be. Okay, before we move if on I to Rye. Uh, Larry, if I can follow up on that, sure. Will the cert will the certified letter uh, mention whether or not their water system uh, is mitigating lead um, 
as it is supposed to do with the uh, the uh, anti corrosive chemical that I can't remember the name of um, that for example Flint used to have before they started cutting corners and doing all their uh, hanky panky stuff uh, will it will it tell me or whoever that but don't worry there uh, there is an anti corrosive in your water uh, that prevents the lead uh, from leaching into it. So, Mike, I know, or Brian, I know you're not on the the um, team's meeting here, uh, but one of our team members just put in the the chat, and we can we can send to you an example of these notices. And so, but but I understand the question. I understand the question, and I think what. Uh, uh, you're, you're asking is do are folks going to be assured that that appropriate steps are taken uh, and that their system is in compliance uh, on the website that we uh, put forward? Uh, there is a, a number of resources where residents can go with if they have questions and, and be able to uh, communicate with us about uh, the compliance statement, uh, the, the compliance status of their particular water system. Right, so drinking water watch is there and available, for example. Um, but it is not the case, uh, Brian. If if this if this was suggested in your question, that every system has corrosion control. Corrosion control oh, yeah. isn't required in all instances and doesn't become a necessity unless there's an action level exceedance. Um, that's what I mean by saying that the paradigm that exists is reactive and that we are changing that. I understand that, but the problem with Newark was that, uh, well, there were multiple problems with Newark back then, but half of its water did have that, uh, that agent, uh, uh, apparently the other half did not, I don't remember why, uh, but when they were measuring it coming out of the reservoir, it was fine. And what happened was they went into people's homes and that's how they determined that lead was in their water, you know, unless they ran it for 10 minutes or something like that. Um, but because of their service line or possibly their, their uh, indoor plumbing also. Um, and I'm just thinking if, if I'm out there and I get this letter and it says, hey, don't worry, you do have a lead service line, but we're taking care of it. And I know anything about lead and water, you know, well, wait, well, you know, I mean, well, are you telling me I shouldn't drink the wire water because there shouldn't be any lead in it at all? There's no safe level. I, I guess that's what I'm getting at. And I don't know that 186,000 people are all going to go onto the website to, to look up their water system and see if, uh, what compliance is going on. That's why we're putting out all of this information because we imagine that folks will have those kinds of questions. Right? So we're trying to prepare ourselves and we're suggesting that all the water systems be prepared to answer those types of questions. Okay. Okay. Do we know, uh, do we know when the first uh, letters will be sent out? It's quite and possible that some of them have begun to be sent. Okay, so it'll be staggered over the next seven days or whatever. Um, it, it is supposed to be by February 22nd. By February 22nd. And we don't know who is um, sending it out when. Is it is it sent out by each water system? Those 570 community water systems that I mentioned all have an obligation to notify their customers. Okay. 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 Thank you. You're on mute, Larry. Sorry. Uh, right. Do you still have a question? Yeah. Uh, two. Um, in terms of testing, it sounds like so. People are going to get this notice. Just help me make sure I'm correct here. People are going to get this notice. It's going to say that they have a lead service line. They're not going to know, you know, because it depends on the make and model of the pipe and the chemistry of the water, how much lead is in their system. 
without a further test. Uh, how available will those tests be? That's question one, you know, how people get them. And then question two, you mentioned a new lead and copper rule is in the works. Um, will that stick to the 15 parts per billion standard or change that for, for lead in, in the future? All good questions. So um, I, I can't speak to the availability of testing um, or, or that that's going to be folks initial reaction. I don't, I don't know that. Are tests available? Could you call a laboratory in order and, and get a test as a consumer? Yes, absolutely, you can. Uh, Brian, could you put yourself on mute, please? So uh, uh, a resident yeah, can sorry. certainly do that. Um, I think in the first instance, they might call their water company, right? So I think water companies could potentially get those kinds of requests um, is what I would imagine. Um, there isn't a requirement in, in as part of this law that water companies provide those tests as part of this update. It is a point of public information, a point of public information and education to ensure risk awareness. And that's part of the way that the regulatory system is built, right? It's not always the case that every that that we can identify every single risk and eliminate every single risk. But part of the way the regulatory scheme across all of environmental law works the way it does is to help folks know that risk exists. And that's the point here, right? That's the point of this notice. And so that they know now, they know risk exists and they know that their water system must replace that line. They must. And so that's that's the point of the of the notice with respect to the lead in uh, the New Jersey lead in copper rule. Um, it's not our intent to change the federal action level. It's our intent to make it irrelevant. And I think that's a really important point because rather the whole scheme right now is dependent upon a certain proportion of samples within a system exceeding an action level that we know isn't safe and then doing something about it, but then maybe not, right? That's the way the system is. And so what our intent is and what is a shift in paradigm, no waiting. That's the principle, no waiting. You go, you investigate, and you set parameters for protection. You don't need to have an, an exceedance first. To my mind, it's the way it should have always been built. And so that's what we are doing here. We want to make the action level irrelevant. Because how in the world do you set an action? How in the world do you set a level when there is no, <laughs> there's no way to be safe? All you can do is protect, assess and protect. That's the principle that will drive it. Okay, Scott. Hi, uh, thanks. Just a few questions. Um, are we talking about just residential properties, service lines, to residential properties? It's the case that lead service lines overwhelmingly serve smaller buildings. Is there a potential that a lead service line serves a small building that's not a residence? I suppose that's the case. I think about my town and there's, you know, a bunch of of, of houses that well runs houses that are now offices, right? So I, 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 it is certainly the case that it will not only be residential, but we, we would anticipate them that the overwhelming majority are. Okay. Does the notice go to the property owner? Uh, in the case of an apartment building, does it go to tenants? Trish, do you want to address how that uh, is broken down? And so the way that the law it requires that both the paying and non-paying consumer is notified. And so that's distinct in a law to capture both the property owner and um, also potential resident that might be renting or in the case that you're describing um, in in like a larger off, you know, off, like a building sense. So it's it, the intent is to, to the property owner and the non-paying consumer so that the consumer from that residents or building is notified. Okay. And lastly, the 1 million pipes of unknown um, material. What do the utilities have to do? Do they have to dig up 1 million uh, streets and test every pipe? How is that determined? 
They have got to figure it out. Right, so there are a number of different ways that you can go about identifying a lead service line. Digging up the street isn't the only option, but they need to discern the material in whatever way is appropriate based on those circumstances. Maybe that is, maybe it connects to the meter outside and there's a way to know by being external to the building. Maybe you have to be inside in the building. Maybe it, it, it's not always the case, right? I, I think about Newark and how, um, you know, what they did there was they went block by block and what they didn't know they found out right if you think about uh the experience uh of the last few years at, at one point we thought 15,000 lead lines in Newark then 18,000 and 19,000 turns out to be 23,000 right um the point is that they have to look and they have to identify and there's a bunch of different ways to do that okay um right you one last I'm, I'm sorry, sorry just one last question uh a lead service line has often has two owners, utility from the main to the curb or property line, and then the property owner uh, under uh, their property. Uh, that has been a problem in terms of replacing them over the years. What does the law do to address that if it does anything? It makes it irrelevant, just like we want to make the action level irrelevant, right? This is a public health issue. And in some way or another, we all own a part of that. And so what the law does is it puts the burden upon the water system. Irrespective of ownership of the line, the obligation is upon the community water system to identify, to report, to notify, and to replace. The payment for that replacement could work differently, right? The payment in the case of a government-owned system could be assessed directly to it, the property owner that owns it or can be spread across the rate base. In the investor-owned setting, it can only be spread across the rate base. And that is what the law does. And then there's another law that gives that that sets up a, a scheme whereby the the water system can gain access to the private property for purposes of replacement. Okay, um, Rai. Sorry, uh, two things. Can you can you go over what the the, the public system does again? Uh, what a customer might have to pay. If they're served by a municipal system, you just said it, but but can you make sure. that clear? So some people are going no, to it, it's it, it's it's different, and I'm glad that you're attentive to it. So um, there uh, there are a number of laws that were enacted, right? And there are pieces that pertain to investor-owned systems, pieces that pertain to uh, publicly owned systems, government-owned systems. In the publicly owned systems, and that would apply to those that uh, that a public entity owns and operates and those that a public entity owns but are operated by an operator which could be an investor owned system um so for the government owned systems the cost of this replacement program can be assessed to the individual homeowner whose line is replaced or it can be put together and spread across every ratepayer in that system For the investor-owned utilities, they don't get the option of direct assessment. It has to be spread. And that, in part, I, has to do with their regulation by the Board of Public Utilities. Investor-owned systems are regulated from a rate perspective by the Board of Public Utilities. The municipal or government-owned systems are not regulated that way. Okay, Michael Catalini. Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify uh, earlier this month, Commissioner, you had mentioned that the state was getting about $170 million as part of the federal infrastructure funds for water system um, overhauls. Uh, is any of that money able to go toward um, toward the lead replacement lines under this 2021 state law or or it depends on whether the utilities come to the stakeholder meetings. Can you just talk about whether, 
you know, there's a chance that federal monies could cover the cost of these replacements or will it really be on property owners or spread across the rate base? Thank you. I'm, I'm glad for that question as well, Michael. Thank you. So start from this principle that the, 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 the cost of replacing lead lines uh, is not small, right? And let's assume that that is spread across the rate base. That, automat that, that will cause an increase in the cost of water to our neighbors, right? That, but our water infrastructure investment plan will help to lower that cost so that we can deliver affordable, clean drinking water. But the only way that that helps is if these community water systems that are municipally owned get around the table, take part in the shaping of the water infrastructure plan, apply to the water bank for the funding packages that we are right now putting together. This is the time. It's part of why we launched the WIP when we did. It's now, right? For the next fiscal year, it is now. And we'll do this again in the beginning of next year, right? And the year after that, we do it every year. And so we have the benefit now of bringing into that program this additional federal money. But we're not taking that federal money and handing out checks to water systems. That's not how it works, right? Because in order to have the greatest reach for what, for, for the magnitude of the, the type of transformation this is, to, in order to have the greatest financial reach, we need to take the, the, the free dollars that we can offer along with the low interest uh, loans that we can offer and bring in the market rate uh, the the market rate loans that we can get uh, through our partnership with the I bank and package that all together and take what maybe let's say there's a a twenty million dollar replacement program in any one municipality and we drive that interest rate to the floor and it's debt service for the next thirty years that that delivers affordability. But if the local partners do not get to the table and they do not participate in the water bank, they will have no choice but to send rates up because they have to do the replacements anyway every year. It's why we're trying, part of why, we're trying to drive the use of the water bank because it is an affordability solution in addition to a public health solution and an environmental solution. That's why we want greater subscribership. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Right. I just, I put this in the sidebar. Uh, so the, the sample letter that you sent it makes it seem like people can get a free test, but that is not largely correct. It's not required. Okay. It is a kindness by a water system of good conscience. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, cycling through, do we have any other? Questions? Okay. Um, Commissioner, do you have anything you would like to add before we close? Only that if you know, more if more questions come up, as I imagine they will, um, if if folks do become concerned and you're you're getting a lot of, of outreach. Um, and there, there are things that, that materialize. There's information you need to do good reporting. Call on us. Um, we, want, we, we want to help your work be successful because the reporting that you do uh, helps our work to be successful, and so we're grateful, so thank you. 
OK, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you everyone for joining. Just reminding you that. Um, you know, recording of this will be made available. Please email me if you uh, need a copy of that. If you need a link for that. Also, we do have B roll footage of some um, of a typical lead service line replacement. Um, email if you need that as well. So thank you everyone for joining us on this very important topic and I wish everyone a, a, a great day. Thank so, you all. Thank you. Thank you. All.